Hi, this is Bob Murphy, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm Doug Stewart, and today we are going to share with you a talk that we recorded in 2015 at the Christians for Liberty Conference. Now, you might be thinking, well, you already have that on your website, or I've already listened to this, but really, what we're going to do is something a little bit above and beyond. So instead of just simply throwing up a piece of audio that we have recorded, Norman and Nick and I sat down and we listened to the talk. It was given by me. It's called Gospel Against Empire. And what we did was we decided to pause and reflect in the recording and share with you some things that we had on our minds, whether it was a review of what was had been said, maybe just some clarification. I think I was asked whether or not I would actually say something a little differently or add something to it. And there's sort of an addendum near the end about why it's why this particular topic is very important. We hope you enjoy this episode and we have a few more coming as well. So stay tuned in the coming weeks for that. And here we go. So today what I want to talk about is who we are as Christian libertarians and kind of thinking about the word Christian. What does that mean and how does that connect to being Christian? So if you're here today and you're one but not the other, I hope you'll enjoy your time learning about libertarianism and Christianity. Um, Get to know some people. Some of us lean left, some of us lean a little right, some of us are a little off balance. But, you know, we're on a journey, so... uh, it's, it's all good, become friends with people and uh, just keep talking about it and uh, keep asking questions, keep reading, keep, in, keep looking into things. So we're all on a journey. If you were to take inventory of what you see around you in the world, what would you think our world needs most? What grieves you most when you watch the news? What kind of things does your heart ache for? Like when you read or see on the TV another mass shooting, um, or maybe there's a devastating hurricane in a poor part of the world. Uh, what is your reaction to those things? And then when you see the reactions that you probably see on Facebook and all kinds of postings and, and you see news, you know, uh, news shows having people give their opinions about what the government ought to do, what is your reaction to that kind of thing? And if you think about that, a lot of times our inner ache is in a lot of ways we want to we want something that we call peace. Uh, a long time ago, when I did not have very good taste in watching movies, I remember a movie called Miss Congeniality. If you've watched it, it's a very, it's pretty funny, I guess. Uh, Sandra Bullock plays an undercover agent, and she has to infiltrate the Miss United States pageant, or whatever non-real pageant they had to pick for the movie. And she was like a no BS kind of person. And during the pageant, they had to ask every person what do you think our society needs most? And so in very plastic sort of way, all the ladies were like, world peace. And everyone just erupted, you know, the crowd just erupted in applaud. And then Sandra Bullock's character gets up and she says, well, that would be harsher punishment for parole violators. And it was like crickets. (laughs) And she figured that out and said, and world peace, and then the crowd erupts, right? So it's interesting because it illustrates that the answers provided by all of those other characters were about the same as their makeup, plastic. Peace, as trite as it might sound as an answer, world peace, yeah, 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 everyone says world peace, it sounds kind of hippie-ish, but as trite as it sounds, we do value peace as as libertarians. Um, You consider Larry Reed's book, Anything Peaceful, I really love that phrase. Um, If it's not done in peace, we're against it. We want to eliminate the force, uh, any uh, use of force or coercion in our world. We're highly critical of the state because we think that that's the state's MO. Um, That's how they operate. We believe that conflict can be resolved through conversation, cooperation, and whether it be individuals or even institutions. And this commitment to peace is most succinctly described as, you might have heard of it, the non-aggression principle. So no aggression is permissible unless it's in self-defense. Offensive aggression is just that, it's offensive. And, but for Christians, 
Yeah, we could say that Christians value peace, but peace isn't exactly the best word because it doesn't really adequately capture the, the real biblical concept of peace. I think a real word that we could use is shalom. The Bible starts with the world being spoken into existence instead of appearing as the result of the warring gods of Babylon. If you do any comparative studies in the origin stories of the ancient Near East, the Israelites in slavery were a people longing for peace, for shalom. We see God actively working to get his people there. And then we have God actively working through the Old Testament. And then we have Jesus and we have the incarnation. And so Jesus is very important. We're going to get to that. So the heart of the Christian message is, I think, that God in Christ has come to bring peace to the world, not just the absence of violence, but the presence of shalom. So let's actually define shalom. Cornelius Plantinga defines shalom as the webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. Shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be, the full flourishing of human life in all aspects as God intended it to be. So what does that include? So I think it includes things like justice, connectedness, wholeness, integrity, empathy, compassion. What are some of the results that would come from shalom? So Hugh Welshel from the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics, I'm pulling this list from him, prosperity, um, health, reconciliation, contentment, good relationships between nations and peoples. So that last one is an interesting one, and I want to focus on it just for a second. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul identifies us as ministers of reconciliation, and Christians have a unique role to play in the world of politics. If believing in Jesus were merely just about a personal spiritual revival or inner awakening, consider that Pilate and Caiaphas probably wouldn't have had colluded to crucify him. Early on, Doug makes a point about the non-aggression principle, and I know he understands this very well, so this is just a clarification point. Aggression is the initiation of physical force or the threat thereof. And defensive use of force is permissible, but the initiation is what we say is impermissible. That is uh, just a, a brief point of clarification, and we want to make sure that that is, uh, is crystal clear as we go forward here. Uh, and, and I think it's really cool, though, the way Doug frames the next part, where he says uh, Christians are more than non-aggressive, per se. But we are, we're, in, in, we're interested not just in being non-aggressive, but we also want to promote shalom. And that has implications for politics. Uh, and it, leading up to this quote where we've paused here for a moment to comment, I think this is a really, really interesting way of framing uh, why it is important for Christians to understand libertarianism in particular. And as we go on here, I think Doug's going to to make even a, a greater case uh, for for the things that Christians should be and become in, that makes sense in, in kind of a libertarian way, but also like parallel exactly with our theology and, and what we believe uh, about being a Christian as well. I think a lot of people have a hesitation toward libertarianism because it doesn't have the shalom aspect to it. I mean, you, you'll read people like Jeffrey Tucker talk about how we're about human flourishing and promoting those kinds of things. On the one hand, libertarianism doesn't really sound like it promotes that kind of thing because it's it starts with a baseline, the limits of violence or a commitment to nonviolence. It's a here is the proper use of violence and then it stops. And I say, well, yeah, but this is where our Christian our Christianity, our Christian theology, our Christian uh, yearning for hope and for shalom comes in. What do you guys think of that? Is that a libertarianism and more, infusing more into libertarianism? For me, it seems like if you want to have the conditions that will make for peace, you, you need to have the baseline libertarian framework in play, and then it builds from there, whatever, whatever methods you want to go. Through. Yeah, well, I mean, we've talked before on this program and, and in other venues that you know, libertarianism is just one part of our worldview. It is not our complete worldview by any means. And so this is really one of the distinctions of what it means to specifically be Christian and libertarian. So, I mean, our, our secular friends and, and those of other, other faiths uh, who are libertarian, we, I mean, we're, we're grateful for them. We, we, we agree on 
pretty much all the practical implications as far as as our political economy. But but that only takes us so far. Merely uh, it, adhering to the NAP in a political context, uh, the non-aggression principle, it th- that isn't going to save the world because ultimately there's still a, a a sin nature in our hearts that has to be overcome by Christ and. Really living that out goes goes far beyond just saying don't initiate force. It has to do with actively going out and building the kingdom and ministering Christ's love into the world. And so, I I do think you could say that's libertarianism. And you know, it's it certainly doesn't conflict with uh, libertarian political economy in any way. But simply simply looking at libertarian political economy. Uh, doesn't get us all the way to where the world needs to be. We need Christ for that. This goes back to the argument that has been made for eons now about thick versus thin libertarians as well. And to a certain extent, I like to put us forward, you know, as LCI, as Christian libertarians, as when it comes to our libertarianism, we are thin insofar as we agree with the fundamentals as, as, you know, as Nick just said, you know, we agree with libertarians on all the practical working working out of the libertarian political ideal. But, you know, when it comes to talking to other Christians, you know, Christian to Christian talk, well, we kind of got to be thick, too, insofar as, look, what we want as Christians, our special worldview that we hold that is all-encompassing of who we are as people, is facilitated, protected, um, and brought ever for farther forward with this the thought processes that come from libertarian political philosophy as well and that maybe it, that that is a, a something that you should be considering oh non-libertarian christian and so yeah we do make that kind of thick argument as well and i think that's that's why this sort of uh, discussion is important norman when you debated or had a discussion with al moeller on a different uh, podcast a couple about a year or so ago one of the things that Moeller was trying to get you to do was make libertarianism an all-encompassing worldview. He kept kind of coming at it from that angle, and I, I kind of rolled my eyes when I heard this. I'm like, that's, that's crazy. That's like taking one particular subset of theology, like ecclesiology, and making it all theologies and make it apply to every single part of life. And is it would, would you agree, and this is kind of the way I've come to think of it since, that Christian political philosophy – is one element of theology, not the whole ball of wax, so to speak. Like it's one element of it is is we're Christians and we have a certain soteriology, we have, you know, certain ecclesiology and eschatology and all that. And then when it comes to political theology, we're libertarians. Yeah, it's the classic confusion of conservatives and liberals alike in the Christian church today that their polit- their political philosophy you know oftentimes requires them to to look at other political philosophies as as this sort of completely other and all encompassing thing as opposed to look we're you know we may differ on on, on a few uh, on a few points here and there uh, but you know we're we're all you know from a christian point of view we're heading in this in the same godward direction uh, what we're what we're seeking to do as Christian libertarians is engage with you as people who have a different political view and say that you know your 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 theology of the state and of uh, of uh, civil government and whatnot and the way that you think about the use of force in society is perhaps not as consistent as you once thought uh, with the rest of your theology. And that by engaging in this different type of uh, – or di- different way of thinking at least a little bit would improve the way that you think about uh, society and culture at large. And our view of the gospel is that the kingdom of God does not come by force. It, we don't, we, it doesn't come at the point of a sword, and therefore the gospel has something to say about – the kind of you know kingdom, if you will, that does wield the sword and does demand your allegiance. And I think that'd be a good place to jump back in. Jesus was a threat to the Roman Empire. And it was not because Jesus was a king like Caesar. It was because somehow what happened when people turned their allegiance to Jesus, it became a threat to the Roman Empire. Identifying a, today as a Christian poses a little threat to an American empire, but it probably should. We heard that in, our, in the last talk. There probably should be a little bit of a threat to, to the American empire, or a big threat. 
Ron Paul, for instance, a uh, big example would be his high critique of the Federal Reserve System and how important that is. That is a big example of speaking truth to power. If allegiance to Jesus Christ does not in some way pose a threat to the empire, the gospel has been diluted to suit our consumeristic palates. Believing the gospel or being saved is not just a consumption good of eternal significance. It's a radical reorientation against empire and toward shalom. So libertarians value peace, Christians value shalom. So the commitment to peace as a libertarian is sort of a minimal commitment to peace. Libertarianism is you know, more about of what we can't do to one another. Christians, however, are more about how do we promote shalom and go toward in that. Think about the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. So certainly not harming your neighbor by advocating for freedom is included but it doesn't capture the essence of what it means to love somebody. So I think it's a really good verse for us to use as libertarians and say, nope, freedom is, you know, you, you can't harm your neighbor. That's part of the love thing, but it's sort of that negative aspect to it, right? Um, but the essence of shalom isn't captured by non-aggression. We can't say, well, okay, as long as there's no, pe or there's no uh, you know, conflict, although conflict will always exist, as long as there's no violence being done, that's not enough. There's more to it, and, and that's what shalom is all about. So when we confess Jesus is Lord, we're not just referring to a religious dogma. We're declaring the counter truth against the empires of this world, which say, we rule you, bow to our demands. We're declaring that Jesus is the rightful ruler of the world and we can stand against empire and say, no, 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 you've got it backward. You're really not in charge, God is, no matter how many weapons you may have. The empire is not inclined toward peace. It is inclined toward violence. Yeah, modern empires have become particularly cunning in promoting peace and kind of tricking us into believing that, uh, you know, they're going to give us peace, but usually it means that we have to bow to, to their demands. Um, so, you know, if you think about that, the result is usually a sort of cult-like fashion. We want someone to rule, rule us and lead our country. Um, we look for the perfect rev regulation and we just keep trying to redo the regulations. That's what the left wants to do. They want to just keep tweaking the regulations to account for every little bit and somehow we'll end up with a peaceful world. I don't know if it's going to work out that way. I'm pretty confident it won't. Um, and then you have people on the right glorify the, or even worship the military uh, instead of treating it as just maybe a rightful place and protecting the people group. That may be, it's a little bit different, right? So worship versus you have a place, thank you very much. Um, and so, and then we go through, you know, what Bastiat has talked about, you know, everyone plunders everybody. We just think that if we can wield the state in some way, we can start having what we want that other people have, even if it's not for ourselves. We may want it for someone who's poor. Well, it's still kind of the same problem. So the Christian commitment to peace starts with allegiance to the Prince of Peace. Our allegiance is important, and our allegiance to Jesus Christ is a threat to empire. The, left, the message of liberty is a threat to empire. And in a way, Christian libertarians are armed with sort of both things. Libertarians, we can speak truth to power to the state. As Christians, our allegiance to Jesus is a threat to that empire. Um, and so the world must be rescued from violent regimes. One aspect of the concept of salvation is that our world needs to be saved um, from violence is one, one way to look at it. So how does that work? Okay, glad you asked. So when we look at our place in the ongoing narrative of history and we think about what's happened before us, and we keep going back, and as Christians, we will look to the Bible, we need to sort of talk about the big story. Um, but before I get to this big story, we need to talk about a Greek word, telos. So back in February, I was at a conference, uh, International Students for Liberty, and I went to a session by Jeffrey Tucker, and he said this, and said, if we knew what would result from freedom, we wouldn't need freedom. Now, I agree with that. But that's a very libertarian thing to say. And as you may know, libertarians talk a lot about the ends versus the means. So you have people, uh, conservatives and liberals alike, talk about uh, we need to have this result. And libertarians are saying, okay, that's fine, that sounds good, but what does it mean, how do we get there? And what are the means by which we can do that? So libertarians aren't really sort of perceived as folks uh, concerned with the ends. We're kind of obsessed with the means and that's where we kind of evaluate everything we see around us. Well, what is the method by which we achieve this? Is it through cooperation or is it through the state violence? And that's where we are. So 
I think in a way, though, we are concerned with, and maybe this is just my sort of Christian leanings infusing into libertarian, we do have a concern for the ends. It just, we kind of get it about it at a different way. Our ends are peaceful, non-aggressive, and a free from violence process from which emerge outcomes that indicate shalom. So in a way, our ends are the means, or our means are the ends. We don't have this vision that says, oh, well, this is specifically how society ought to look. We want to see people interacting peacefully. We want to see people coming together, the ministers of reconciliation peace. Um, and so when we believe that the end is shalom, this is why I'm going to talk about this word called telos, is because we know how the ending is. So the word telos is a Greek word. It sort of reminds us of uh, Yahweh's uh, expectation or the expectation of Israel that Yahweh would someday come and put the world right by establishing justice and shalom. It was something they looked forward to. So the nation of Israel, uh, they saw, they were hoping and praying and crying out to God and they were fervently believers that their God, Yahweh, would come and set things right. Brian Zond, who there's a book here that you can, you can get for free. It was out on the table, but I'm going to quote from another book. There's a chapter in it, and it's cleverly titled, titled, I Am From the Future. And I really like this chapter, and here's what he means by it. Jesus accomplished on the cross and through the resurrection the seeds of Christian hope, resurrection, and new creation. Theologians will call this inaugurated eschatology, and it basically means that Jesus is not Lord-elect, Jesus is Lord today. Jesus is Lord now. So when Paul says, that's why Paul can say, if anyone is in Christ, there is new creation. Doug, you were talking there about how libertarianism distinguishes between ends and means, and that there's a there, there's a variety of ways in which we could parse that out even now. I'm curious as to, you know, has your thinking evolved on this? Is there anything that you would like to elaborate on to that effect? What would you say that if, if someone were to ask for any clarification with respect to ends and means here? That's a pretty good question. Um, I guess I would say I don't think I would change my thoughts on the ends versus the means. I mean, on the one hand, we think of the ends as goals and goals we wish to accomplish. And maybe what I had in mind, and maybe this is just a tangible way of talking about it, is libertarians probably have in mind that we would really like to have institutions and people committed to a means by which they accomplish their goals. If that happens, there's, there's an end there that, is, that has happened. We've succeeded in theory, of course, this is in the future. We succeed in theory in getting people to be committed to a means by which whatever goals they wish to accomplish are never done through violence or directly or through, you know, some third party like the state. And so on the one hand, we have this, the ends that we would like to see is that the means are peaceful. And maybe, maybe that's just semantics. Maybe it's just a, you know, a clever way of talking about it. But I do think it's very valuable to remember that libertarianism is very much about the means by which anybody accomplishes his or her goals not we have a particular goal and you know we libertarians don't want to see people poor we don't want to we, we want to also see poverty eradicated just because we're we don't want the federal government or the united nations to get it done that doesn't mean we're against the ends it means we're against the means in that particular you know example so perhaps let's think about it maybe this way i think one way that you'll hear people talk about ends and means in libertarianism, and 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 we even see hear, hear this in Christian theology as well, is that there needs to be a harmony between your ends and your means. In the Book of Romans, for instance, uh, there's there's a, a variety. Uh, there's at least two places, right, where there talks about you know, shall we do evil that good may result? By no means. So it's saying there that you might have uh, a, a good a good end in mind, but if you do something evil in order to get there, then you shouldn't do such a thing. That would be heinous to think about. Um, and so that that's that's kind of the way that we think about liberty as well, is that there needs to be harmony between your ends and means. I think that's a fair way of looking at it. I mean, the the verse you just cited from Romans is is highly relevant here for when we consider our our ethics. And when you look at the, the way the state behaves, I mean, almost all of the state's ethics are really 
utilitarian. It's it's whatever they think is going to bring about the best end for for the most people. Um, and I mean that that I guess that's even a, a a soft way of looking at it. Some are just outright dictatorships that aren't that way at all. But even if we assume the sort of large Rousseau type social state uh, that we that we kind of could probably pair up with the modern neo left. Um, that, that that's kind of how they think about it. But libertarianism is is a a natural law based philosophy, and I would argue that Christianity is is natural law based. And so when we're when we're coming from the natural law that flows down from God and from our humanity, uh, we. We aren't utilitarian in the way we think about our 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 ethics. So the the way we go about things is important. If you're if you're if the purpose uh, towards which creation is moving is this shalom, like Doug has been talking about, it's the restoration of creation. It is the return of perfect fellowship between God and man. Then that necessarily entails that we are diminishing and ultimately purging out the evil of the world through Christ, through through the kingdom. And so doing evil in order to try to get to that point, it, it logically it doesn't even make sense. And that's partly why it's it's forbidden to the Christian. The way we go about things is is just as important as the means, and we trust God to to uh, lead us to his ends. A final thought here, I think, that is just we have to bring this up is that invariably in discussions about the state with Christians people who honestly should know better you will very frequently hear you know well you know there's got to be some people in there who just have to be able to make the hard decision who need to be you need to have a certain moral license they won't say it this way but they need to be given special moral license special moral permission to you know make that Make that call about dropping that bomb or to be able to do certain things that would normally be considered pure evil if anybody just did it of their own accord. But for some reason, you know, there there is a, a special moral license that should be given. And they make accounts for this not really with any theological backing other than something on the order of, well, God says the state should be there and therefore it's okay. As though it's it's very deflective, it's a bunch of smoke screens. And I think that's why this particular, you know, discussion is so important to have, is that, you know, the, the Christian tradition is one of, of, uh, of equality. It's of equalizing the moral playing field more than anything else about equality in, in Christianity. It's about equalizing the moral playing field. We're all individually equally responsible to God for our actions, and we can't put, place the blame on other people for moral decisions, and we can't pass off uh, the responsibility for moral decisions to anybody else. It's, it is up to us. I think to those people who are thinking about, you know, we need those certain people to press the, you know, press the button at the right time or make those, you know, difficult decisions that you just mentioned— this is where I would bring up Romans 8 and say God works all things, you know, toward his purposes. I think God does work with humans and he'll make the best of the, you know, bad decisions and bad positions that we've all been in. So, you know, if you want to be thankful that Christian leaders who, you know, presidents and so forth have made decisions that you would say, okay, those are admirable decisions. That's not the same as God endorsing that they had to, you know, do something that in any other scenario whatsoever would be immoral. You you can say you can say that there's a minimization factor going on there, but I mean that obviously leads us down a whole other rabbit hole. But that's not the same as saying that God endorses it. It's one thing to to acknowledge that God uses people who are in you know tough situations. Here's Zon. The world now has a new Lord. It is G it is Jesus the Christ. The proof of this is that God raised him to life again after the principalities and powers of this age put him to death on a cross. All who believe this proclamation and confess Jesus as Lord are forgiven of their sins. Now, rethink your life and live accordingly. So, if we're, if we're from the future, but we live in the present, then we must introduce shalom to a world which doesn't have that insight that we have. They don't see new creation. They don't have those eyes to see. In the end, heaven comes down to earth and God rules and there is shalom. Where we see Jesus reigning and ruling today, that's where we see heaven on earth. 
In fact, that's what Jesus taught us to pray. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. What does that look like today? If God needed the state to carry on the kingdom of God, there'd be little need for the church or this community of followers that started after the resurrection of Jesus in the book of Acts. So I know that some people, you know, most conservatives and progressives say that the, that the state has a role in doing some sort of right things that help create this world of peace. And I don't know, Jesus didn't seem to have any concern with what, what the Romans did uh, to advance the kingdom of God. In fact, he was actually a threat to it, which is part of the point here. Um, Babylon had plenty of strength and could have been used to extend knowledge of Yahweh throughout its empire. God could have used the power and extensive reach of the Roman Empire to send the message of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. But what we see is God becoming flesh at a time when empire was at its pinnacle. It was, the Roman Empire was very powerful. During a time when the Son of God, the phrase Son of God, was a title given to Caesar Augustus. So this wasn't just, oh, well, we're going to call Jesus the Son of God and we're going to call Jesus Lord. This was, this was wording that was very much a threat to empire. This was them saying, no, we will not bow to Caesar. Caesar is not God's son. Jesus is God's son. This wasn't just, uh, this was a threat. So the end to which history is heading, heaven on earth, is one away from alliance upon empire, the state, in our, the way we look at it, and toward reliance on God as king. How does God operate as king? When we look at the story of Israel, we see that they are thoroughly immersed in a grander narrative that framed their identity. So we talked about telos, and we're going to talk about identity. Their oral tradition, which we have as literature today, we have some of it, were identity-forming stories. That's why generations long after the Exodus, the Israelites were celebrating or enacting Passover because that, that was their past, and it was in, deeply ingrained in their identity. They were shaped by their past, but they were oriented toward the future. And what was the future? Well, the day when everything would be put right, shalom. So let's do a little tour of, of this history here uh, and how God rules. So when we go back to Adam, we see humanity wants to be godlike rather than godly. Our propensity is to usurp God's true authority, uh, whether that be through eating the fruit of the knowledge uh, or if we go a little bit further, we see the Tower of Babel. They want to build a tower to heaven and have you know, uh, progress and civilization in that way, or they want to have a nation or a king, I'm sorry, like other nations. They want to be all like all the cool countries and have a human king. When Israel asked for, a, asked for a king, they were rejecting God's kingship over them. God relented, but we must remember that this is plan B. Plan B is, okay, you can have a human king, but it was really a relenting and um, not what God's plan was. So we read in 1 Samuel 8, it's sort of a passage where you, if, you, if you're just starting to read it and you know there's a lot more to read in the Bible, you're going to think that, you know, later on God's going to say, I told you so. Um, and so, in fact, some scholars would actually believe that based on the final composition of when that was actually written, there's a little bit of that in there. It's like, hey, we told you this was going to happen, or I told you this was going to happen from God. So, but even then, this is interesting, God adapts to a new reality, letting Israel be free to choose a human king, and the rest of the Old Testament gets focused on Israel's story centered on a story of David. So I'm gonna read a few scripture passages. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Of all my sons, and the Lord has given me many, has chosen my son Solomon, so this is David, to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord forever, of the Lord of Israel. Praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne as king to rule the Lord your God. Rule for the Lord your God. So David kind of ruling in place of God or in his proxy, I guess. Because of the love of your God for Israel and his desire to uphold them forever, he has made you king over them to maintain justice and righteousness. So this was God's plan B. God was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll go with that for now. Um, but we know what the end result is. That was exile. So in exile, we read from Amos, the prophet, that there was this hope that they were looking forward to. So Amos writes, in that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins, and I will rebuild it as it used to be. So when, when they looked forward to a restoration, they, that their telos toward the future, it was sort of framed in language that talked about the establishment of, an, of a new Davidic kingship, sort of uh, something that would be better than even David. So we shouldn't read this, though, as God's like, well, okay, maybe a king worked after all. It's just that's the way God decided to sort of condescend and say, okay, we'll, we'll talk about it in those terms. That's how you want to think about it. So when we get to Acts 15, 
Apostle James verifies that exile is over because Jesus is the new beginning. God is is once again on the throne and ruling. When Jesus is announcing the kingdom of God is near, he is saying exile is over and now God is the rightful king. Notice something about the phrase kingdom of God. The of God is important because as much as we see God's newly restored people as sort of a restoration of the Davidic kingdom, it isn't so much a better plan B, but it's sort of a revised plan A. It's God ruling again. So when we think of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, it's not so much a place out there somewhere or, or maybe in our imaginations or um, you know, inside our hearts, something like that, although those, that, that in a way is true. It, it's more about what is happening here and now, what sphere of operation is happening. And when we see Jesus ruling, that's when we see heaven on earth. Whatever happened 2,000 years ago, God had brought the future of the world into the present. The early church embraced this as a future orientation, and they rooted that in the history of Israel. That's why you see them using the story of Israel in the, in the, in the letters in the New Testament. We can, we can observe that. So in a very real sense, when the body of Christ is in the world, we make the future happen in the present. It was demonstrated by God's Son. It was carried on through his body, the church, led by the Spirit. So insofar as God's rule and reign is manifest today, we are witnessing the future. Identity meets telos. There's a lot of stuff we could talk about here, a lot of things to unpack. One thing that came to mind for me is, as Doug was uh, talking about the the ways in which uh, the early the early Jews kind of viewed the Messiah and what they were expecting, uh, it reminded me of that you know, there were a number of people that did have a very political view of what the Messiah was supposed to be. Uh, And and it went from, you know, the more extreme vision of, say, the Zealots, who are mentioned, you know, a couple of times in the Gospels, you know, even have Simon the Zealot as uh, part of the disciples, uh, you know, who who really believed that the political uh, interpretation of this Messiah was supposed to be a, a true earthly king that would restore Israel to its rightful place in the world as being this dominant, you know, superpower again. And and to others, you know, it was just the throw off of Roman rule or just the just having any independence again. And so they had this political thinking about what the Messiah was supposed to be. And when Jesus comes along, he upends what they believe the Messiah is supposed to be. Um, they, he, he, he says, yeah, in a sense, he is claiming a political, uh, a political point, you know, calling himself the son of God. And that, that is, you know, a political, a political statement in that day and age in many respects. Um, but it, but it also, you know, is political in other ways. And just the way in which, uh, the, he calls people to interact in society is completely counter to the way in which the world operates at that point. He talks about, you know, how Jesus says that, you know, the kingdom, the, the kings and princes of this world, uh, they want to, the, the, the rulers of this world want to lord it over them and lord it over the people. But that's not the way you're supposed to be. The, the greatest among you are going to serve and so on and so forth. It's a very different vision politically of how the world is supposed to operate. And again, as we mentioned earlier, this isn't some sort of you know, well, th- this is the way that most of you are supposed to operate. There will be special moral license for some. He doesn't say that at all. He says that the way that the, that the power structures are are very different than the way that I envision the world. That's the way that Jesus is saying here. Uh, so that's I, I think that's kind of cool and, and to kind of realize that there is, in a sense, a political reading going on of the Gospels that can happen, um, it, it, even in the context of their own time against the power structures that were existing at that moment. And the Christians who came uh, in, the, in the first century paid that paid a very dear price uh, for accepting this new vision of the world, as we, as we well know from, uh, the, from the apostles uh, up to you know, the, the, the early martyrs. Yeah, and you know another point that I think is, is very relevant here is when we think about the, the trajectory to which history is moving, you know, regardless of what one's eschatology may be. I mean, we we certainly have people of all different eschatological views who are, are Christian libertarians. But regardless of what your eschatology may be, there 
that there's certainly a sense in which we we must agree that the, the kingdom of God has been inaugurated by Christ. You know, he says the, the kingdom of God isn't out there or over here. It's in your midst. It's amongst the people of God. It's amongst the church. And Doug had mentioned N.T. Wright in his talk, who has done a, a tremendous amount of scholarly work in this area. Another person uh, who's done quite a bit of scholarly work in that area is uh, Scott McKnight. But the, the, the kind of unifying theme here is that the, the, the kingdom of God, right, is, it is the church. It's God's people, God's reign through Christ over his people uh, actuating the, the new creation. And so regardless of whether you think that's, that's going to be uh, accomplished ultimately through just the, the amillennial return of Christ or the postmillennial coming of the kingdom or the premillennial – uh, coming of the kingdom, whatever your eschatology may be, there there's a very real sense in which the kingdom is here among us now, and it is our responsibility to live in the the already but not yet, to use uh, George Ladd's famous phrase. The incarnation of Jesus and his message of the kingdom make it clear that the purposes of God will one day be fulfilled. How is that? It will be accomplished through the body of Christ, the church. Now, N.T. Wright, a theologian that I highly respect, uh, calls, uses the phrase, the renewed people of God. So think of that as our identity. We're led by the Spirit into this new kingdom reality. So the Gospels were stories written to proclaim that God has become king, and Jesus' main proclamation was, the kingdom of God is arriving in me. So we have no reason to doubt that this new king, God ruling, has every power, does not need the state, to advance this kingdom, even in spite of all that stands in its way, including the state. Jesus' way was peaceful, nonviolent, and self-sacrificial, which stands in contrast to the political kingdoms of this world. So, what am I saying? Are we, am I saying that Christians are to be political? Yes, we are. But that's not, ex you know, usually when we say, what does it mean to be political? We often mean it means get more involved in politics. And so to be political uh, is, is interesting. So what, what I think it means is that we are to embody what the reign of God looks like. And in doing so, we become a threat to empire. So if we want to be involved in politics, and I don't really have any quarrels with people who do, um, you just have to think of it as sort of a, a minor chord in, in God's grand masterpiece. If you want to have a role in, in being into you know, getting elected and all those things. I have no quarrels with that at all. Um, but we don't want to mistake the fact that as a, as a community of followers of Jesus, the renewed people of God, we have a king that does not need the state. We need to embrace the message of Jesus and embody it in the world. And in contrast to the state, we can demonstrate, and it doesn't have to be just in our communities as, church, as Christians. We can demonstrate this with other people who don't even share this view, uh, that we can cooperate and share and live in community uh, and we are capable of producing better goods, more goods and services than the state could ever provide. Um, so we have this, we have a telos, we are oriented toward the future, we have an identity. That identity is a renewed people of God rooted in sort of the story of God uh, bringing and working with his people throughout, throughout history. What does that mean for us today? We live as sort of resident aliens, you know, resident, resident uh, aliens in a world of empire. And we have been given the creative task of speaking prophetically to that empire. So what does a prophetic voice look like? Let me quote Brian Zahn again. In the midst of a hateful, violent, and idolatrous world, the church is to be an enclave of love, peace, and holiness. To be a faithful church, the church must be distinguished by holiness. Not holiness as puritanical moralism, but holiness as otherness. We are to be other to the values of this present darkness. In the world of politics, we know as libertarians that we are considered other. Right? We can spend a lot of time as libertarians about trying to abolish programs that are supposedly good for us, you know, ending the drug war as, as uh, Lawrence Vance talked about. We can do that. I think it's important. I don't have any quarrel with that. But if we're going to act as people who are oriented toward the future, because we know Shalom has no room for empire, we can sort of plan, expect the state to at some point become obsolete. So let's plan on that. We don't see the early church moving to overthrow the Roman Empire. And, you know, it's interesting. We can get into a debate over Romans 13 and, and you know, what role the state might have and do we respect the emperor and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if you, if you put yourself in the shoes of those in the early church, they were probably so excited at what was happening. I mean, Jesus was resurrected. It wasn't just 
like all of the other tri attempts to violently overthrow Rome, which had happened, and even tri had, uh, was attempted after that, uh, God raised Jesus from the dead. There was, there was new creation. They had expected uh, something like that, but they didn't know what it was going to look like. The future happened to them. They were like, well, we're expecting this, and then it happened right then and now. So they probably were like, let's just live in this joyful reality that we're, we're new creation. We're the ministers of reconciliation. We're going to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth, telling, giving the message that God has come and become king and live according to that reality. So they were probably just a little preoccupied, and maybe that just wasn't their main concern. Let's abolish the state. So, libertarians, we've been keen on identifying the nature of the state, that it's rooted in violence. I've sort of, I've sort of talked about that today. Uh, it, the only mechanism it really has is the use of force. Um, so we can call, out, call it out on overt evils, or we can even call it out on things that are just inefficient. I mean, there, there's not a, it's not every little thing that the state does is absolutely evil in, the, in, in a, what we would call evil. There are things that are you know, somewhat innocuous, and, but those aren't, those aren't, we can do better than that, is, is my point. Um, so the reliance on the state must decrease and reliance upon peaceful means of social progress must increase. Libertarians are poised to offer a beautiful alternative to the limited options from which the church and the world are used to selecting from. So here's a list. We believe in a free society. We believe a free society is the best framework for diffused power so that people are genuinely free. We believe that stable property rights are the best framework within which free humans can cooperate and resolve conflict peacefully. We embrace the intrinsic value and worth of every human being. We believe in peace and are against all forms of initiation of aggression. We pray for and actively work toward a world where the will of God is done on earth as it is in heaven. We talked about telos. We are oriented toward the future. We have an identity that is the renewed people of God standing up against empire, and in, as such, we speak prophetically uh, to empire. So there is a tip for you, and in another way, it's just the tip of the iceberg, because a lot of this topic is very, very deep. It takes a long time to really get into every little bit of it. So I just want to give uh, basically two concluding thoughts, and then we'll do Q&A. I think libertarians should use wisdom and discernment when we defend freedom from the Bible. Uh, I don't think Jesus was a libertarian. I think he wants us to be, but I don't think he was. Um, and in this, sort of in the same way that I don't, I don't think the early, that the early church was not preoccupied with abolishing the state. Uh, there, were, there were other concerns going on there. Freedom from empire is certainly a part of the good news. It doesn't encompass the whole gospel. We want to advocate for liberty, but that's not the whole endeavor for working for God's peace. That's where our Christian identity comes in and says, okay, well, we can start with this minimum non-aggression, but going forward and promoting peace and demonstrating shalom uh, that, that we need to. So libertarian peace is not identical to shalom. So embracing a dual identity, libertarian and Christian, means to go beyond fighting things worth fighting against and begin striving for that which is worth striving for. So, Doug, one of the themes that really came up in your talk quite a bit there is the the sense in which Christianity and the kingdom of God is a threat to empire. But I think it's worth noting to our listeners here that the way in which it is a threat is precisely not in the world's sense. I mean, this was Pilate's error when he was questioning Jesus. You know, he's, are you a king? And Jesus you know, says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. In other words, they take up arms to defend their Messiah. And this is, this is what the Jews of the first century in Second Temple Judaism, the, the, the popular expectation was that Messiah was going to be a military Messiah. He was going to be a king in the militaristic sense like David who would come in and overthrow Rome. But that's not what Jesus' kingdom looks like. So there's a very real sense in which when we live out the gospel, when we when we live out the kingdom of God and we pursue shalom, that does undermine the empire because the empire is following the world's ways, but the kingdom of God is not. And so and unfortunately, throughout Christian history, many many Christians have made this very same mistake in taking up arms against the government and and trying to fight tyrants in that sort of uh, 
second temple Judaism mindset, but that's that misses the point. Uh, we 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 subvert the empire through love, not through uh, sedition, not through violence, not through war, but by being the people of God and loving our neighbor and loving our enemies and 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 pursuing like like you talked about in the entire uh, this entire time the things that make for peace. That's what subverts the empire because the empire is operating under the world's ways and we are not. Nick, I think that is an important maybe clarification or you know addendum to what I was saying in the talk because you're right. We don't want to advocate that Christians take up arms and fight against you know a particular any particular government. That would be kind of against. It'd be kind of missing the point. I always wondered as a kid why Rome saw a threat in people who simply just wanted to go to heaven when they died. Because that's kind of what I understood, you know, the gospel to be all about. And I have since learned that there's more to it, of course. And one of those things is that the way of Christ is transforming the world for the better. And I almost wonder if there's this little bit of, like... uh, Rome was fearful that it would not be needed if Jesus if if Jesus was successful if you will or if the church were successful doing things that are prophetic against empire not only come against it in ways uh, you know in very obvious ways like being against you know war being against theft being against things like conscription um, any you know, or even more obvious and more historical things like slavery, but even things that just make the state uh, kind of obsolete. So not only in just you know, really overt evil ways, but also in ways that are a little bit more innocuous, but still important to the institution that we call the state. In that, it doesn't really like it when people come up with solutions outside of it. So there is a little bit of that. I, I would say it's venturing outside the theological realm of of what it means to be anti-state, but it also kind of infuses a little bit of libertarian angle to it in that we can work against the state by making it obsolete, and that is a very peaceful way of going about it. Doug also made an in- interesting indirect reference to a book, and we just want to call attention to it here. He talked about being resident aliens in this world, and that's a uh, a title of a book by Stanley Hauerwas and William Willimon uh, that I, I, as I recall, was written in the late 70s, and Doug can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Uh, but it's an excellent piece of work, and uh, we highly recommend it. Um, as, a, as something that you can read and learn a little bit more about the theology of being in the world but not of the world. Uh, and so as we cl- bring this uh, to a close here, I'm just curious. I want to ask Doug, you know, like, what do you think that uh, people should really take away from this? If you had to bring bring it down to maybe just one or two sentences that, that they ought to take away the, from this talk, um, what do you want people to know? As I was listening to this audio, this talk that I gave back in now, it would be 2015, one of the things that got me really excited was something that I had said about God you know, choosing to become incarnate in Christ at a certain time in history. And I got really excited about that because I would put it this way, uh, you know, just to rephrase it a little bit. God, in God's infinite wisdom, chose to become Jesus on earth at a time during the Roman Empire. God could have chosen whatever time in history to become human and save the world. But that's when God chose to do it. It's a very stark contrast between the way of the world, the kingdoms of this world, and the way of Christ. And for God to say, nope, I'm king, that means something radically different for our day-to-day lives. It means we live differently. It means that we think differently about all kinds of things, including the state, which is our main point of this podcast. It means that we radically rethink how we approach power, how we approach each other. I mean, obviously it has implications all over. I think that point over the last couple of years has, has kind of stuck in my mind that, oh, God knew what God was doing to choose what we think of as the first, now the first century to become incarnate and demonstrate love, totally unconditional love and forgiveness to humanity for its violence. That is a lesson I think worth worth taking home because if we have any notion of justice at all, it is toward this concept of, of shalom. 
So thank you for joining us for another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. This was a little bit of an experiment for us to do kind of an annotated version of some talks. We didn't want to be lazy and just throw up a bunch of audio that we had on file for the summer. We wanted to give you something kind of new and fresh, and I think an annotated version of that did the trick. We'd love to hear from you if you want to let us know whether or not that was a good idea or if you have any other creative ideas for us. If you want to reach out, you can submit some feedback by emailing us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com, and you can reach us on Facebook, Twitter, and of course our website, libertarianchristians.com. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. The audio engineers were Doug Stewart and Jason Rink, and voiceovers were by Matthew Bellis and Caitlin Horn. If you'd like to find out more about the LCI, please visit us on the web at www.libertarianchristians.com. Libertarian Christian Podcast.